Well, listen, I want to pick up where I was last week. I want to talk to you about overcoming unbelief. This is overcoming unbelief part two. If I don't get through all of the sermon notes today, I'll have it written up in a blog that will go out the beginning of the week. You can find that either through the church uh, email. If you're not signed up, you can sign up for that or my blog site, bobsavelle.com. But I, I hope to get through all of this, but I, I just sense the Lord is doing something today. So we'll just see what's, what's happening here. And so if you've got your Bibles, go to Mark chapter 6. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6. I'm going to recap for a little bit, weaving some new stuff in as I recap and then move into some practical principles to overcome unbelief. Now, Jesus went out from there to his own country and his disciples followed him, Mark 6, verse 1. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue and many hearing him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things. And what wisdom is this which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? It's interesting that the miracles are related to wisdom. Verse 3, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James, Jonas, Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Now he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them, and he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. And so as I shared last week, Jesus has traveled now from the northern area of Galilee about 25 miles southwest to his childhood Uh, hometown of Nazareth. And so when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. And so what Jesus is doing here, or what Mark, the writer of this gospel, is doing, he's contrasting some interesting things in Mark chapter 5 with unbelief in Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 5 is a miracle chapter. Three significant miracles take place in Mark 5. In answer to a question at the end of Mark chapter 4, the very last verse of Mark chapter 4 is, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Remember that. Jesus and the disciples have gotten into a boat. They're going to cross over the Sea of Galilee, and a great windstorm arises. Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat. Have you ever felt like Jesus was asleep in your storm? He's not asleep, folks. God's delay is not a a no answer. It's an opportunity for you to wait in faith and to trust God in the midst of it. And so the disciples wake him, Master, we're perishing, and he wakes up and he says, peace be still, and the wind and the waves immediately calm, and then they get very, very fearful. Who can this be, they ask. So Mark, he answers them with three miracle stories in Mark chapter 5, that miraculous deliverance of the demonized man with the legion, the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years, she's healed, and then the little daughter of Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, whose daughter died, and then Jesus raised her from the dead. Who can this be? He's got authority over the wind, the waves, sickness and disease, the demonic powers. Nothing is impossible for him. This is Jesus. And Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, church. The same Jesus that calmed the storm then calms the storms today. The same Jesus that liberated the demonized then liberates them today through his church by the power of the Spirit and the authority of his name. And so all these people, they're astonished at his teaching. Where did this man get these things? They're amazed at his teaching, but they're also offended him. Why? Number one, his family heritage. Isn't this the carpenter, Mary's son? And as I shared last week, they're basically saying, we know him and his family. They are in the lower echelons of society. And remember, back then, there was no upward mobility. A carpenter was the lowest of the trades. They were primarily a stonemason that also worked with wood. That was the lowest of the lowest of the trade, and there was no upward mobility. And so they are offended because you have this rabbi, self-proclaimed rabbi, teacher, prophet, miracles are happening, and all of a sudden, he's proclaiming some things about himself, and they're offended, and they also know his family. 
Number two, is teaching and self-proclamation offend them? I didn't get into this last week, and you can read the whole passage in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 30. But if you remember that passage, it's the same story, parallel in Mark, where now all of a sudden it tells exactly what Jesus did that day in the synagogue. He gets the scroll of Isaiah out and he begins to read. And you pick this up and it's amazing, right? He says, the Spirit of the Lord, Luke 4, 18, is upon me because he has anointed me, quoting from Isaiah, to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. If you have any doubt what your assignment in the kingdom is, number one, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as you love yourself and go set the captives free. That mandate for the church has never ceased. There's a go in the gospel. We're to go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations, right? And so Jesus says, this is my mission, to set at liberty and to bring healing and, and to bring deliverance. And he goes, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. You could say that was a powerful sermon that day. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. They know his family. He's just a tradesman who was a carpenter. They don't even know, you know, how did Mary get pregnant? Uh, you know, what is this thing about a virgin birth? We don't know. Uh, you know, the rumors went around town about Mary, you know. Of course, we know his brothers and sisters after, you know, Joseph and Mary had Jesus. You know, again, ma you know, immaculate conception and everything that happened. And all of a sudden, she gives birth, and then they start having children afterwards. And it's like, we know his family. We know all this about him. And they're so offended that if you read that passage in Luke, they're literally escorting him to the edge of the hill where the city is built on the edge of town, a cliff, and they're going to throw him over the cliff and kill him. That's what we do with God's messengers, by and large, through the history of God's people. We don't like the message that God wants to bring. We stone him. We kill him. Jesus indicates to him that he, like the Old Testament prophets before him, have not been honored by rebellious Israel. Their lack of honor or acceptance of the messenger and message remove them from the blessings he desires to bring. He wants to bring healing and deliverance and freedom to an entire city. But he can't. He can only, and this is, I mean, think about this. God eternal in human flesh, miracle after miracle, the dead are raised, food is multiplied, Storms are, are silenced, demonized, people are set free. All of this stuff is happening. He gets to his hometown, and it says he can do no mighty miracle there. Why? Because they're offended at him, and that led to their unbelief. People ask, why don't we see more miracles in the church in America? Why don't we see? Because most of us are filled with unbelief. We're believing believers, unbelieving believers. We believe, but only to a degree. I can remember the first time I heard someone teach on Matthew chapter 10, verse 7 and 8, where Jesus gives part of the commissioning to the disciples that later is really wrapped into the Great Commission. He said, you know, go preach the gospel. He goes, heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Cast out demons. Raise the dead. And I remember the first time hearing that. It's like, I'm okay with healing the sick. I can believe that. I, I'm okay with proclaiming the gospel, maybe okay with the leper thing. Don't know if I have enough faith to touch a leper yet. Come on. But the dead raising thing, huh. you see, we, we draw little boxes around what God can and cannot do. Can God resurrect a marriage? You betcha he can. It may look dead as dead, God can resurrect it. Can God resurrect it? A church has fallen asleep? Absolutely. I'm not saying you guys have fallen asleep. You're going to be more alert when you stop going to Dairy Queen, too, by the way. That has to get that sugar. You're going to feel better, okay? Nothing is impossible. But you see, we draw, we draw boxes. God can do this, but I don't know if he can do that. We do it all the time in the church. It's not just the world out there that doesn't believe in Jesus. The church does it. 
We're okay with Jesus doing certain things. We're not sure about other things. That was then, and it's still true today. You see, they struggled with the idea that Jesus could be inaugurated in the kingdom of God. It was scandalous to them. Again, because of his family, history, and heritage, he did not conform to their preconceived ideas about how the Messiah would come. Again, sadly, their preconceived ideas became an obstacle to faith, like the outsiders described earlier in Mark 4.12. Remember, Jesus said, They look and see, but do not perceive. Hear and listen, but do not understand. We live in a post-Christian America. 83% of Americans say, by Pew Research, will say that they're Christian because we're born in America, born in a Christian family, whatever. 83% of Americans say they're Christian. Yet church attendance, even in the Bible Belt, is less than 20%. In the western part of the United States where we live, it's less than 10%. Yet so many people say they're Christian. I submit to you that at best they're unbelieving believers. At worst... I think many of them are falsely converted or never really converted. We have a lot of people that give mental assent to the faith, but they've never been born again. They look and see, but do not perceive. Hear and listen, but do not understand. You see, unless a man is born again, he can't enter the kingdom of heaven. How do you get born again? By throwing your heart and your life right into Jesus, saying, listen, my way didn't work. My, I don't care how righteous you are. You're still with sin. The good news is his love for us through Christ was shed. And we say yes, and we genuinely say, God, have it all. Take my life. I completely surrender to you, Jesus. At that moment, when we genuinely pray that, and we surrender that to him, all our lives to him, all of a sudden, the Spirit of God fills us. We're born again. We're baptized by the Spirit. Into Paul writes about this, into the body of Christ, the eternal church, into him. And now, it, it, spiritually, what's happened, we've been co, co-crucified, co-buried, co-raised again, raised in his resurrection life and his authority. We're united together with him, and it's an amazing thing that Christ does for us. That's who we are. But make no mistake about it. On every Sunday morning in America and around the world, in churches, there are people that come. There are those who don't know Christ. Maybe they're seeking, maybe they're wanting to know him, but they don't know him. There are those in our families that don't know him, and you know what I'm talking about. Don't lose sight, keep praying. America needs another revival and awakening. Hmm. Arise, church, and shine, for the light has come. It's Jesus, and he's in us. Again, often our preconceived ideas how God will or should act become stumbling blocks to our faith and relationship with the Lord. Our carnal human nature and reasoning can easily be offended with God and with others. Like I shared last week, God is loving, merciful, and kind always. We may not understand. Do you know, do you re- <laughs> do you know it's the kindness of God sometimes not to actually bring physical healing in someone's life? Because he's after a spiritual issue in their heart first. That's the kindness of God. I've I've written books on healing. I'm all about divine healing and believing for his presence and his power to heal and set people. But I know that there are times God will not physically heal or bring a breakthrough in someone's life. It may be another area of life because there's issues you want us to deal with first. God is always loving, merciful, and kind whether we understand it or not. God's behavior can be unpredictable. God does not conform to our preconceptions about him, nor does he need our permission. God does not need our permission to do or not do what we think he should do. Don't be offended at God when God does not act or respond as you believe he should. Isaiah 55 verse 8 says that his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. We sometimes bring God down to our level and we expect God to act according to our understanding, our human reasoning, our human understanding. And yet the very mercy and love of God is no, I can't move in that way. You don't see the whole picture. Be careful of human reasoning. It's often blind to God's perspective and his promise to you. The writer of Proverbs underscores this principle, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. You, you know this verse. It says, trust in the Lord with all your 
heart. That, that Hebrew word trust, I believe it's just said, it, it, it means a firm reliance upon. It means a firm conviction of, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding, your own reasoning. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. So we want to rely on him completely. We want to acknowledge him in all of our ways, another translation says. And that word is from a Hebrew word, yada, which means to, to know God in a very intimate way. It's like the same word where it says Adam knew Eve. It's the same word used, yada. There's an intimacy there. There's an intimacy with understanding God and his ways that circumvent our understanding. We're not going to be free of human reasoning that pulls us away from God or, or what God's doing unless we're really intimate with him. It first begins first with being born again, and then it's allowing our minds to be renewed and transformed to think like God thinks and allow the spirit to move us where he wants. And so God's promises then transcend our current perspective, and often our circumstances. Focus your mind on what God has done or is doing. Refuse to entertain thoughts and reasoning that question God. That's unbelief. Faith receives the promises reality often before your understanding or senses can fully grasp what God is doing. It's a whole other message, but sometimes we rely on our five senses and, and we, we're leaning on that or on our emotions or what we think we understand rather than being led by the Spirit and trusting God in the midst of it. Some of the greatest answers to prayers I've had isn't a word to me or, or, or God revealing something or even a word through somebody else, but it's having a peace that is rock solid. All the paths of wisdom, Scripture said, leads to peace. Sometimes we're running for another word or looking. I, I'm all about prophetic ministry, and that's wonderful. I love how God ministers in that way. But sometimes we just need to be with the Lord and sit before him and just wait on him and let his peace sustain us. That's an integral part of trust, how we trust him. Nazareth experienced no miracles, only a few sick were healed through the laying on of hands. Again, we see this contrast in Mark 5 where faith is making demand on Jesus and the result is miracles. But now, unlike Matthew and Luke, Mark does not soften or omit this statement of unbelief that limits the power of the Son of God. And their versions, it's a, those writers recorded a little differently. Mark goes right to the chase. He goes, They're, they were filled with unbelief. They were offended at God and filled with unbelief. In fact, Mark desires to highlight the necessity of faith. And as I shared last week, one of the things we always teach our, our leaders and our altar team workers, and when you're praying for people, please never pray for someone and say, listen, if you had more faith, you'll be healed. We never want to do that. But I'm going to stir the pot a little bit today. Faith is an element to seeing a breakthrough, and see, whether it's healing or finances or your marriage healed or situation at work turned around or revival for a nation. Faith is, is, does come into play. Now, he's the one who gives faith. Paul writes about this in Romans 12, 3, that he gives to each one a measure. The Greek is metron. It's a sphere. He gives each one a measure of faith. We have a responsibility to steward over that faith. Faith is both a fruit. Galatians 5, through 26, you can read about the fruit of the Spirit. Faithfulness, faith is a fruit, part of the fruit of the Spirit. It's a fruit of the Spirit, but it's also a gift of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, uh, you know, in the nine gifts there. And so we can ask God for a gift of faith, and sometimes he gives it. Usually it's when he gives a gift of faith, you know it. You have an assurity that what you're praying for, what you're believing for, that thing's going to be answered. But listen, our day-to-day -day living, we live life day-to-day. -day. Tomorrow is Monday morning in February. Come on. All right, you're going to get up tomorrow. You're going to, all right, praise God, you're going to get up, right? I'm going to try to waken some of you up, all right? <laughs> Excited, anticipating, right? Okay, but it's another Monday morning in February, all right? And so it's just, a, but here's the thing. Day in and day out as you're doing your time with God, right? Faith is building and growing. And so we want to position ourselves to grow in faith. So, and we'll get, I'll get into more of this in a minute, but we need to understand that, that we have a responsibility to grow in faith. Jesus commends great faith. 
Few things seem to cause as strong a human reaction in Jesus as a lack of faith or conversely, great faith. I gave these two examples last week. I want to touch on one again before I get into some more new material. Matthew 8.10, it's the story of the centurion. He's got a servant who's sick. He wants Jesus to heal him. And Jesus said, okay, good, I'll, I'll go and pray for him. Jesus, and, and the centurion says, no, no, you don't need to come. Just, just, just say a word, you know, and, and my servant will be healed. And then Jesus heard it, Matthew 8.10, he marveled and said to those who followed, assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And the servant was healed from that hour. Faith came into play. I don't want you to leave here today, you know, feeling condemned in any way if you feel your faith is small. What I do want to do is inspire us to go on for more faith. Because I think there's some things corporately he wants us to believe through for that are beyond our wildest dreams. Amen. Matthew 15, 28, the story of the woman from uh, Tyre of Sidon. She's got a demonized daughter and comes to Jesus asking if her daughter could be set free. And Jesus, he's on a mission to reach the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he's just passing through that region. And so it's not time yet. It's not until after Pentecost when the Spirit is poured out. And, and now the church is given a mandate to go to the Gentile regions. But Jesus is on a mission from the Father just to reach the lost tribes, the house of Israel. And so he, he goes, woman, it's not fit for me to give you that which belongs to the house. And give, give the bread that belongs to the, to the family table, basically, right? And she says, but Lord, even the dogs under the table, right? Paraphrasing are worthy to get the crumbs. And Jesus answered and said to her, O oh, woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. She was able to pull through faith onto something that was reserved for another time. What if the awakening in America is five years from now? Is it possible the church could come into such a place in America that the awakening begins now, this year? Yeah, be great. What if the breakthrough in your family or your individual life, something that, that you've put off, well, you know, I can see maybe in two years, maybe if this thing, if I do this and I work and I keep, you know, progressing in this way. What if God's saying, no, 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 put your running shoes on. It's time to run. It's time now. Sometimes we're waiting and God's saying, I'm waiting on you, church. You see, there is nothing impossible with God. <laughs> We sing it all the time. Great is our God. I love that song. We sing it all the time, how great God is. And yet we put restrictions on him. All impossibility is with us when we judge God's promises through the negativity of unbelief. I want to challenge you this morning. Is God currently revealing promises to you that seem impossible? Is it possible that unbelief is hindering your faith and worse, hindering you from seeing the answer to what your heart longs for? I think God, one of the things he's doing in this season, he's started the year off with these wonderful prophetic words and the spirit moving and the guarantee of the spirit given to us and the guarantee of God's promises. And now God's saying, okay, now let's deal a little bit what's holding you back from seeing some of those promises. I want to remove that unbelief and that doubt. How many of you need a financial breakthrough? A few of you. I shared this story here before at the church. I shared it last Wednesday night at the, uh, the uh, Spanish-speaking Charismatic Church. In 1991, Carol and I were newly married. We were living in Melbourne, Florida, attending a Charismatic Church there. And we were just, you know, <laughs> we were just excited new in the things of the Spirit, baptized in the Spirit about a year before, and just growing leaps and bounds, and God speaking different things to us. And by the way, it was that same year of 1991, the Lord reminded me of this this past week. I pulled this word out. I saw in 1991 a technicolor vision, one of the first major visions I ever had after I was baptized in the Spirit, of all of a sudden me speaking in front of a large church congregation, being the pastor of that church, were healing miracles and deliverance were norm where prophecy was flowing free and it was like I had no grid for it I was still an electrical engineer 
I pulled, I, and it's a, it's a short little word. I pulled that out and showed Carolyn. I said, I forgot all about this vision and this word God gave me back in 1991. See, a lot of times these things are in seed form. Later that year in 1991, we had, we had started a business on the side. I'm still working as a, as a software or as an electrical engineer doing some software stuff too. And I'm doing that. And Carolyn was, left her engineering job, started running this business we had. We did this little print advertisement thing for, it was like a little TV guide locally. Remember those back, back in the day when, before you had everything on your cable TV, right? You could get these little newspaper guides in the store, and we, we did that in our area. And it was doing really, really well. But we had incurred, you know, several thousands of dollars worth of debt to start it and get it going and all these kind of things. And... Uh, so, you know, we were praying about a lot of different things, and we went to this financial seminar that the church put on. Maybe it's time to have another one, Crown Financial. And uh, uh, we went to that, and I was really impacted by it. And the last session, I think it was on that Saturday of the seminar, the, whoever was facilitating uh, that meeting or that seminar basically said, okay, now spend a moment, pray, and ask God for a goal, a financial goal for you and for your family, um, you know, for, for this coming year. So I, I, you know, sat there in my chair, and I, I said, okay, Lord, is there anything you want to show me? And I heard the Holy Spirit as clear as anything. You will be debt-free by October 1st, 1992. I'm like, I mean, that wasn't like a goal. It was like a prophetic word. And the, the facilitator said, write, th- write it down, whatever the Lord has shown write it down. I wrote it down on a piece of paper. In fact, I think I still have that piece of paper. It was such a milestone in our lives. Wrote it down, shared it with Carolyn, and here's, here's the challenge. You can stagger an unbelief at God's promises, or you can take them and bathe them in prayer and stand and pray and stand and pray and keep standing and praying, even when it looks like nothing is changing. You keep praying. We kept, I kept working my job. Everybody go to work tomorrow. Work your jobs. Pay your bills, okay, all that stuff, right? And we keep doing everything we knew to do, we, all those good financial principles. We're giving to the church. We're doing all that stuff, everything we know to do. And, and we're praying and we're believing. Carolyn's working hard at that business. I'm helping her on the side, you know. And all of a sudden, in the summer uh, of 1992, God says, I want you to sell the business. And it was an interesting, there is a whole journey there. It, it, it was like, okay. And so now we put the business up for sale, and there were some other things that happened, you know, and he had to sell our house, and we sold our house, and then God worked a miracle there to get that sold and everything. He was getting us ready to launch us into something, and we didn't fully see it. And then God worked it out where we got rent-free in an apartment complex through the advertising we were selling in, in the thing. We got put in a 55 and older uh, community. They said, well, you're our token young people. We're in our, like, early 30s, and... They had to have so many young people below 55. So we get rent-free. We're in there, and it's like we're running ads for them. And now God's saying, okay, sell the business. We're like, okay. So we, we, start, we go through someone, and we start advertising the businesses for sale and everything. And it looked, The type of business that it was, we had no assets. We had nothing really with it. All we had was some clients that are loose, I mean, we, we had to convince them every week why it was so good to advertise with us, okay? And we had nothing to really sell. And so, and so all of a sudden, towards the end of the summer of 1992, all of a sudden we get a phone call from this guy up north. I think it might have been Rhode Island he was living in. I don't remember exactly. And he goes, he goes I, I heard you have your business for sale. I'm interested in maybe buying it. Long story short, the man came down to Florida, saw what we were doing, loved what, we, what, what we'd established, met some of our clients. He had confidence he could take it over. He offered us twice as much as what we had put into it to start it. And the, we were supposed to close on September 30th, 1992, which happened to be Carolyn's birthday. But it got delayed for some reason until the next day, October 1st, 1992. We closed on the business. The man gave us a huge check. We paid off all the, the debt that we had, and we had a bunch of money left over, thousands of dollars, and God used that as a spring for to launch us into ministry. Now, we would still work as tent makers. I'd still work some engineering jobs in the years to come and, and different things like that, but that was a huge turning point for us. Here, it seemed impossible. Everybody say, impossible. impossible. With God, impossible. nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Uh, I, yeah, come on, give me a hand clap. God did it. We, 
we put limitations, and yet God wants to move in a way. See, God's revealed word to us gave us more faith as to what God wanted to do. Now we had to come into agreement with that. And again, for those of you maybe with the finances or if it's healing or whatever it is, this book, the B-I-B-L-E, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth, okay? It's right here. Spend time in the Word. Get it in you, right? Find out what God is saying about a matter. Get those scriptures. Write them down. Pray over them. Pray through your Bible. Take the Word of God. Pray it. Listen, I'm not advocating a name it and claim it, blab it and grab it, okay? I'm saying take the promises, believe, learn to believe them, come into alignment with what God's saying. Just don't declare, you know, you want a brand new car or some crazy thing like that. No, no, no. But if God, if you need transportation, begin to believe God for that, right? Are you guys with me? There's a balance to this prosperity message, but an imbalance to the message is not to believe that God wants to bring a release for his people. Well, this church wouldn't be here today if we hadn't have trusted God on that word back then. Are, are you with me? Some of you, he wants to launch into ministry. Some of you, he wants to launch some music, some worship. It's not just church planning. Some of you, there's some inner healing ministry that you have on your heart you want to be involved with. I, I can just name different ministries. It, it, it takes some of it. You're going to need to be freed up a little bit. Of, uh, come on, are you with me? It's time to come into agreement with what God's saying. Some of you have a desire to go on a missions trip. It's a good goal. Trust God for the resources. You know, one of the greatest joys I've had as pastor of this church is years ago, we raised money at a time just before we started construction on this on this new sanctuary, uh, to build a church building over in India. And God spoke to me, he said, if you sow seed into India, watch the new sanctuary I'm going to give. So we spent uh, over a four-year period of time, almost $100,000 we sowed into India between building a building over there for, in one community, a church building, and uh, four major ministry trips and crusades that we were a part of as a church and my involvement over there. And it's amazing. And then shortly thereafter, God then said, okay, now begin to build this new sanctuary. And then God did it miraculously, that whole thing. But what a great joy for me was seeing that going over there during that construction to see that church building being built in central India in an unreached people group area. And I'm like, I I've always wanted to see wells, wells established in different places around the world, to see church buildings established missionaries sent out, leaders raised up. That's been my vision since God. I said yes to God to see it happen. We can look around the room and say, well, we're just a small charismatic church in Tucson, or we can look with eyes of faith and say, but with God, all things are possible. Amen. Nazareth could have had a revival. Instead, they rejected the move of God because they could only see Jesus from a human perspective. They could have been, as I shared last week, in Antioch Church. They were unable to see that there were whole families and people that were hanging in the balance that God wanted to reach. And so their unbelief caused, think about this, church in Tucson, speaking out over the airwaves. Our lack of faith at times is affecting families that he wants to free and set them free from the chains of bondage from. But when the church moves into the fullness of what God has, then a potential for a whole city. And if you go to Acts chapter 13, take a look at that this week. And look, the first Gentile apostolic ministry thrust happened with Paul and Barnabas and that group there in Antioch where they were first called Christians because what? Something shifted from Jerusalem that was focused mostly on staying there and mostly just witnessing to the Jewish believers and ministering to them to all of a sudden now God is moving something into Antioch where they're beginning to be thrust out because he wants to reach the nations what if God's changing our paradigm and how we do some things here because he's about ready to send some out <laughs> we got some going to South Tucson right now right all of a sudden he's wanting to do something beyond just the four walls of a small church building on Sunday morning we got to begin to see like God sees his resource is unlimited his power is unlimited that's not the issue the impossibility comes with us when we get filled with doubt and unbelief the people of Nazareth blocked what Jesus wanted to do for them because they only saw him according to the flesh. Remember I said that from 2 Corinthians 5.16 last week. We regard no one, Paul said, according to the flesh. We have, though we have known Christ according to the flesh, 
yet now we know him thus no longer. We have to see by the Spirit what God's doing. And so, Proverbs, here's another one, Proverbs 14.1, the wise woman builds her house, but the foolish pulls it down with her hands. What? Foolish pulls it down with her hands? I submit to you, that's unbelief. Unbelief hinders the expansion of the church. Jesus invites the 21st century church to build with spiritual eyes, to see in others in their new life in Christ. And I'm just going to prophesy, Ari, I saw you up here today, and I saw, I saw in a female version, I saw a little Goliath. I mean, I mean uh, not a Goliath, I'm sorry, David running against Goliath. Dear Jesus, help me. I saw, and, you, and, and no sooner did I begin to see this, you started going like this with your hands. I'm going, yes, Lord, let her run towards Goliath. Let her throw that stone. Here's the thing, Ari. There's a revivalist inside of you. It's not just about worship. you got the heart of a revivalist. And God says, run against that enemy and release the stone. Don't fear. Go against this thing. And church, we got to understand. we got to see with spiritual eyes. It's not the quality of the voice. It's not this or that. It's what the Spirit of God is doing. Zoe, God says, right, do the album. Get that album produced. It's time those songs hit the airwaves. Come on. Why, why is it important for this house and sound and work? Because there's a sound of revival and awakening. He wants to release in the church in this hour. Your pastor, you're getting all, listen, it's going to affect families. I see chains breaking off of families. I see marriages that are in, boom, all of a sudden, the sound of God going out through the church. It's a sound of triumph. He always sends Judah before. <laughs> Judah goes before the praise, the tribe of praise. Second Chronicles 20. Whew. God said, send the praisers out. Though this vast multitude has come against you, Jehoshaphat, by this time tomorrow the prophet said, listen, you believe the Lord and you believe his prophets. You send, you send the worshipers out. You send them out. You praise. They sent the praisers out. How do you go against an army with a bunch of worship people? Some of you are skinnier than I am, for God's sakes. I mean, you know, you guys don't look like warriors. No, it's not about what they look. Stop looking in the spirit. We don't see in the flesh any longer. We see in the spirit. That's how we see. See what God is saying. I see a generation of warriors. I don't see a passive church. I see a bunch of praisers rising up and saying, I know something is about to shift. I'm going to pray through the night. I'm going to spend time in worship. I'm going to dance and praise and declare. Some of my biggest breakthroughs in life has happened when I've danced and prayed. I, I look really silly dancing at home by myself sometimes. Amen. I don't dance quite like I used to. I'm a little older now, but it's time, church. It's time. I'll write this up. You can read it tomorrow. Overcoming unbelief. Focus on Jesus. Remain in Jesus. Obey Jesus. I, whatever God's in, would you go ahead and stand? I, I don't want to go past. I just feel his presence on something here right now. I, I feel like the Lord is trying to, to release corporate faith and, and this morning, I didn't know how far I would get in this. And again, this last part that I'm not going to cover is good. Maybe I'll touch on some of it next week. But I felt like the Lord, a couple things this morning. If you're here and you don't know Jesus, make your way up front here and, and make a commitment to follow him. You're never going to get really into the fullness of what God has for you to say yes to him. And, and begin to allow him to just transform your life. The greatest decision I've ever made. And, and uh, it doesn't matter your family background. My family background was so broken. And it doesn't matter. You can be on the wrong side of the tracks. And it looks like there's no hope. And everybody else has written you off. But Jesus. But the second thing I felt like. So if that's you today and you need Christ. I, I encourage you. Make your way up. There will be up, folks up here to pray with you in a minute. But I feel like we need to, to pray, and, I, I, and last week it was more of an individual unbelief thing, but I felt like the Lord said, no, no, today first, 
you, you need to pray about corporate unbelief. You see, Nazareth had corporate unbelief. There was citywide unbelief. They couldn't receive what Jesus wanted to bring. And I, I, you know, we live in a region where some of the greatest revivalists and miracle workers in the modern day church have ever lived. You realize that. A. A. Allen was here back in his time, you know, down in uh, Miracle Valley, down south uh, east of uh, Sierra Vista. William Brannan was here, and I know there's a lot of controversy over these figures, but here's what happened. This region largely rejected the supernatural churches and the believers in this region because of some excess they saw or things they thought were wrong. And so what's happened is I, I've been amazed the number of times I've been in conversations with people over the years in this region and, and how much of a cap there is on God maybe moving in miracles again. And yet there are some amazing prophecies over this region about a mir miracles flowing forth from this region again. And so I want to corporately take for a moment, and you know what the greatest miracle of all and you need to hear my heart. I, I, I'm not after just seeing great, you know, blind eyes open and all that. That's wonderful and all of that. That's one. It's great. I'm after the masses coming to Christ. That's what I. Re that's what my heart really beats for. You see, the greatest miracle is a move of God on a citywide level where hundreds. God, when He gave me a word about planting this church, one of the first things He said, "I want you to begin to believe me for a hundred thousand souls in this region." I've waited 20 years now I've nearly carried this, and it's, it's been painful at times. But I also, having to wait. But I also know I'm not going to give up on that. Our, our city needs it. And so I, I want to take a moment, and let's pray church. If you're a visitor today, just join in with this. If you love Jesus, you want to see people come to Christ. Amen? So just pray with me, however. The Lord, Father, we come before you on behalf of a city, on behalf of the church in this region God, through the decades, God, where maybe we've rejected what you wanted to bring, God. Lord, maybe some pastors, ah, I don't, you know, citywide revival, I don't know. You know, miracles, I, I don't know. Jesus, we ask for your forgiveness when the church in this region has been filled with unbelief and doubt and we rejected what you wanted to bring. So, God, today in the spirit, we, I don't know what this looks like, God, on a citywide level. Here we are in our little church here. But, God, I, I just know, God, that you want to do something, Father, that's beyond what we see in the natural. And, God, I, I feel like the church, you're trying to get the church to run, God, right now like David's towards Goliath, God. You're trying to get us to have such faith, God, that we'll pick up with that little stone or whatever and we'll run against the enemy. And so, God, I'm praying right now, Father, that you would not only forgive us of, of corporate unbelief, but you would give us corporate faith. That, God, you give us eyes to see, new eyes, God, in this realm of the Spirit, God, new faith eyes, God, to see what you're offering. And, God, we would join in hand-to-hand, -hand, arm to arm God, with one another during a time of prayer, even during this Lent season, God, this year. Father, we would pray and we'd believe for heaven to come down and your Spirit to move again. And, God, the lost to be saved and the backslidden to come back to Christ, God. And broken homes restored, Father. And broken marriages brought back to you, God. Father, we're asking, God, God, that the, the church would become the altar of the Lord once again, God. We're asking, God, the fire of heaven would fall, God. We're asking, God, Lord, burn the unbelief out of our hearts individually and corporately, God. And now just tell him, yes, God, we say yes to your will and to your way. We want to focus on you, Jesus. We want to remain in you. We want to obey you. So, Lord, have your way. Worship team, could you come up? I think we're going to do this song. If you need to leave, you're going to be officially dismissed, but I want to do some worship. This is a contending for an outpouring of the Spirit song. Amen? So if you need to go, you go. You have our blessing. But listen, if you're here and you don't know Christ, somewhere towards the end of this song, you, you need to come up and just, just say, yes, I, I, I want Jesus. Someone will pray with you. And church, let's pull on heaven a little bit. Let's pull on heaven.